Hi everyone, thank you for being here for week six of our course, Poetics of Anticolonial Joy. Now the actual week six, because I realized that last week on week five, in the beginning of the video, I said week six. Clearly I cannot count. Uh, but anyway, today is the actual, real, week six. And it's also when we begin the second module of our course where we're going to explore questions related to body and movement. In this class today, um, specifically our theme will be the body as witness and the body as map. Now, of course, um, since it's the beginning, this is the beginning of a module, I think that it would be very useful to start the, the class today with a discussion on the body itself. And because in a way, thinking about the body in these terms, of course, um, requires us to also think about how the body is described and materialized and untangled and theorized, which is of course a subject that feminist theorists have engaged with quite extensively over the past few decades. So let's start with kind of an overview of the body within feminist theory, which I think can be quite useful and it can be, it can kind of help us go on as we move through our course and through the semester. I'm gonna start with something that at this point, it's almost a cliche, but I do think that it is a, uh, a work that is very important and very relevant to how we understand gender and helps us kind of theorize and conceptualize it um, also because of how influential it is. Some of you might have guessed at this point who I'm talking about. Um, I'm talking about Judith Butler. So in their influential book Gender Trouble, which was first released in 1990, Butler who is a philosopher, challenges, or to use uh, their term, troubles, established perceptions of gender. Now, their work is further developed in, or further kind of fleshed out to stay with the, uh, with the kind of body-related metaphors. Um, it's further fleshed out in the book Bodies That Matter, released in 1993. In this book, Butler unveils quite a fascinating perspective on how this category is coded, the category of gender is coded. And they frame it as a discursive, performative, and dynamic act of social doing rather than some kind of static, natural phenomenon. Butler contends that gender is in fact sedimented through, and this is a quote, a repeated stylization of the body, a set of repeated acts within a highly rigid regulatory frame that congeals over time to produce the appearance of substance. Now, this is very important, the appearance of substance, that uh, an appearance that congeals over time, that becomes sedimented over time. So time then is clearly a fundamental component to this conceptualization, right? It is through the relentless repetition of these performances that social phenomena become sedimented and ultimately then coded as natural. Through this process of sedimentation then, a set of expectations around bodies emerges, structuring social relations that become then increasingly rigid, as Butler mentions. So gender, Butler observes, is an ongoing and collective performance that is imbued into everyday life and foundational to how we relate to the world. It is a social phenomenon that becomes coded as a natural one from which is impossible to, ex to escape. 
Though Butler argues that desertion from this um, from this system, from this phenomenon, is not possible, she emphasizes that there are ways of critically engaging with the performance of gender. As an example of that, uh, or of these, let's say, critical approaches, Butler cites the cultural phenomenon of drag. Not, they clarify, because the practice is um, a model of subversion or political action, but rather because drag troubles stable perceptions of what it means to be a woman or a man. So starting from this example, Butler encourages us to consider, is there indeed a reality lurking behind the facade and the performance? Presenting oneself with markers traditionally associated with a different gender than the one assigned at birth to us um, is seen as a form of performance precisely, and this is a quote, because we think we know what the reality is and take the secondary appearance of gender to be mere artifice, play, falsehood, and illusion. So we learn how to do gender from those around us and assimilate expectations about what so-called female or male anatomy, physiology, psychology, and so on must be like. And yet, the variation amongst human bodies and identities is so much greater than any of these attempts at classification could ever, ever account for. Now, Black and Indigenous feminist scholars have expanded the scope of these discussions, of course, evincing the ways in which the processes of production of gender and race and the processes of the materialization of bodies occur simultaneously and are inextricable from one another. Hurton Spillers, specifically in 1987, offers quite an extensive analysis of the conditions that permeate the construction of gender for African-American women. She argues that African diasporic subjects, as a result of racializing processes, are placed in a position of both social and biological otherness. That is, the social processes that projects as inferior are coded into matter naturalized in order to justify their ongoing subjugation. And here, of course, we can think about all the discussions that we've had up until this point about how the creation of, a, of racial hierarchies is a fundamental uh, aspect of, um, of colonial structures of power. So... Spiller's work, of course, highlights the ways in which not only the doing of gender and race are performed, but also how these performances become sedimented through the naturalization of difference. Now, all of these works are part of a rich landscape of feminist inquiry, as I said, that actually thrives on the exploration of the kind of complicated relationship between what is perceived as nature and what is perceived as culture. And yet, as uh, scholar Sara Ahmed points out, this social constructivist turn of feminism is often characterized as being anti-biology, -bi of rejecting the importance of the materiality of bodies in favor of analysis that attribute the consolidation of gender exclusively to culture. Butler, Ahmed reminds us, is often singled out um, within this realm as kind of an example of the of feminist work that reduces matter to uh, a question or to exclusively to a question of culture. And indeed, of course, Butler's work, because it is so influential also and so extensive, has elicited a number of responses over the years. 
For instance, feminist philosopher Sela Ben Habib in 1995 wonders, and this is a quote, If we are no more than the sum total of the gendered expressions we perform, is there ever any chance to stop the performance for a while, to pull the curtain down and let it rise, only if one can have a say in the production of the play itself? Ben Habib, of course, here is not um, explicitly accusing Butler and potentially others um, who, who work kind of in the same vein. Um, so Ben Habib is not explicitly accusing Butler of anti-biologism, but she does suggest in this excerpt the presence of some kind of deeper reality beyond the curtain of the performance. And yet, Butler stresses throughout their work that performativity is not subjected to volition, but rather that volition itself is shaped by relation to power. As a result of that, a fundamental question that Butler attempts to pose is not whether um, whether performativity, uh, sorry, um, is not whether to repeat, and this is a quote, whether to repeat, but how to repeat, or indeed to repeat, and through a radical proliferation of gender, to displace the very gender norms that enable the repetition itself. Sorry, I gotta connect my computer to the power source. So, in other words, for Butler, the repetition of patterns embedded in our very conception of the world is inevitable. The manner in which we repeat, however, is subjected to change. And this is, I think, a very, very important point. Now, philosopher Susan Bordo uh, did, did describe did describe uh, Butler's work as antibiology, contending that for Butler, any conception of the natural is a danger illusion of which we must be cured. The cure, she uses a lot of scare quotes here, is to recast all biological claims within the more encompassing framework that sees discourse as foundational and the body as thoroughly text. Now, to, to this, or um, to dealing with similar questions, biologist, writer, and activist, and performer, Julia Serrano, while not directly referencing Butler to pointedly argues that casting gender exclusively in terms of performance is a crass oversimplification. Gender, she contends, is an amalgamation of, and this is a quote, sorry, an amalgamation of bodies, identities, and life experiences, of subconscious urges, sensations, and behaviors, some of which develop organically, and others which are shaped by language and culture. Instead of saying that gender is any one single thing, let's start describing it as a holistic experience. Now, Serrano clearly does not uh, make such direct accusations as those advanced by Bordo. But both of these critiques of performativity theory suggest, as pointed out by Sarah Ahmed, that the social constructivist turn in feminist scholarship has entirely neglected the body as a material phenomenon. Ahmed actually rejects these accusations, arguing that, and I, I do agree with that, um, Ahmed argues that they misconstrue the contributions of Butler and other, other social constructivists to knowledge. Feminist scholars, she points out, have produced very different kinds of critique of the role of biology not all of which depend upon a rejection of the biological as a sphere of life. So thinking in these terms, 
characterizing an entire realm of feminist thinking as being anti anti-biology, thus is, um, and this is a quote, a reduction of the complexity and heterogeneity of feminist work in this period. To say that feminist today, that feminism today has inherited to biologism extends the violence of this reduction. Now, in regards to Butler specifically, Ahmed, uh, Ahmed argues that their work attempts to matter as an effect of the process of materialization, thus offering a theory of the matter as temporal. So for Ahmed, then, Butler does not reject biology and the materiality of bodies as significant factors in performativity. Rather, what their work is doing is offering an insight into how matter comes to matter. Um, indeed, Ahmed contends that Butler's work is, and this is a quote, not offering a theory of the material world, but a theory of how sex materializes or becomes worldly. Now, picking up on these threads, Donna Haraway understands bodies to be both materially and discursively implicated in their own constitution. As such, their boundaries do not precede their conception, but are rather structured through it in processes that are socioculturally, historically, scientifically, geopolitically located. The body then, as an object of knowledge, cannot precede its enactment of these processes. It is, in fact, an actor within a broader space and cannot be analyzed as a self-contained phenomenon. So the constitution of the body as a phenomenon of social doing also finds resonance in the work of Gayatri Spivak, who mentions, and this is a quote, the body, like all other things, cannot be thought as such. I do take the extreme ecological view that the body as such has no possible outline. A body as body is, sorry, as body, it is a repetition of nature. As a text, the inside of the body, imbricated with the outside, is mysterious and unreadable, except by way of thinking of the systematicity of the body value coding of the body. It is through the significance of my body and others' bodies that cultures become gendered, economical, politic, selved, substantive. Now, this process of ongoing construction offers some parallels to feminist philosopher Rosi Braidotti's idea of a figuration which she describes as a vision toward which the subject is moving in an intellectual, emotional, and bodily sense. Indeed, Braidotti emphasizes that though figurations are political fictions that challenge the separation of reason from imagination, they cannot be understood as mere metaphors. There are, she argues, tangible material conditions to being nomadic, homeless, an exile, a refugee, a Bosnian rape and war victim, an itinerant migrant, an illegal migrant. Rather, Braidotti encourages us to understand the figuration as a living map, a transformative account of the self. Figurations emphasize how bodies are located historically, geopolitically, socially. They draw a cartographic map, and, sorry, this is a quote. They draw a cartographic map of power relations and thus 
can also help identify possible sites and strategies of resistance. Now, approaching bodies in movement and performance as a form of figuration allows us then to locate these actors in the world in terms of their material orientations. It triggers a process of sighting where these diffractive patterns can be interrogated and it helps us locate paths in relation to our own. Now, Braidotti's figurations resonate also with philosopher Paul B. Preciado and how he understands the body as a living political fiction or a living political archive. Brada, uh, though he does, he does not um, engage directly with Braidotti, but um, I see the parallels when he argues, and this is a quote, that's how I see the body, as a living political archive. You already have this archive. It's not like you choose things that are more or less outside of yourself to add onto it. You realize that your body is really dense, stratified, and huge. There are connections and relationships that are already there. If you, if you carefully look at it, you realize that your body archive is connected to the history of the city, the history of design, technologies, and goes back to the invention of agriculture like 8,000 years ago. Your body is the body of the planet. When I add a few molecules of testosterone in a huge living archive, well, that's just a minor detail. It's a way of intensification in terms of a cognitive experience. Suddenly, you are intensifying processes that are already going on in your body. Both Braidotti and Preciado's analysis, thinking uh, in these terms, kind of collapsed, collapsed the boundaries of the body as an individual entity. They do not negate the body as singular, but they do encourage us to look into its insertion and thus reproduction within a wider network of phenomena. And I think also Spivak, um, Spivak also kind of references to that. She contends, Spivak contends that the body is an entity coded through repetition, right? An actor within a relational ecology. Butler also argues that gender performances, if you remember, become sedimented through repetitive doings. And Haraway also offers the idea of an apparatus of bodily production. It's not something I'm going to go um, specifically or delve specifically into now, but I think it's also worth mentioning. Now, the figurating body, to use the, the Braidotti term, um, is itself also an apparatus of bodily production. Now, Haraway has engaged the idea of figuration numerous times, most notably in her conception of cyborgs and coyotes. She describes figuration as a useful strategy for a kind of resetting the stage for pasts and futures. And indeed she says that figuration is, and this is a quote, a mode of theory when the more normal rhetorics of systematic critical analysis seem only to repeat and sustain our entrapment in the stories of the established disorders. In addition to that, anthropologist Lucy Suchman emphasizes, drawing on Haraway, the contingent nature of figurations, which, and this is a quote, bring together assemblages of stuff and meaning into more and less stable arrangements. These arrangements imply in turn particular ways of associating humans and machines. Thus, for Suchman, 
for Suhman, interventions in techno-scientific practices might be carried out through a critical consideration, there's a quote, a critical consideration of how humans and machines are currently figured in those practices and how they might be figured and configured differently. Now, figurations are also intimately associated with what Ansaldúa calls facultad or conocimiento, and Chela Sandoval calls the semiotics of the oppressed. These are skills, to kind of go back to this a bit, these are skills that oppressed subjects develop an ability to read beyond the surface in order to face the specific challenges that they encounter in navigating the world. These knowledges inform the ways in which these actors perform. It allows them to trace possible paths and to understand how to follow these paths. It is a strategy of perhaps prefiguration, a habit of mind that is ontologically designed. Now that we're going into Ansaldúa, um, right in the beginning of the chapter we read for today's class, she reminds us, this is a quote, struggling with a story, a concept or theory, embracing personal and social identity is a bodily activity. The narrative works itself through my physical, emotional, and spiritual bodies, which emerge out of and are filtered through the natural spiritual worlds around me. Nature is my solace. It allows my imagination to stir. Sea, wind, trees evoke images, feelings, thoughts that I acknowledge as sacred. If I'm receptive, a new conocimiento, insight, will flash up through the cracks of the unconscious. What I call el cenote, la nori interior, a, a subterranean reservoir of personal and collective knowledge. Its surge provokes a new clarity, inspiring me to formulate ideas that may transform my daily existence. Ansaldúa discusses these questions also in terms of her relationship with a specific tree, which she calls the Virgen de Guadalupe tree. She goes on to write, With my back against its trunk, I meditate, allowing it to absorb my body into its being. My arms become its branches, my hair its leaves, its sap, the blood that flows in my veins. I look at the broken and battered raices dangling down the edge of the cliff, then stare up at the trunk. I listen to the sea, breathing us in and out with its wet, sucking sounds. Feel the insects burrow into our skin. Observe the birds hopping from rama to rama. Sense people taking shade under our arms. And here, to me, is where the convergence between this chapter and the essay that we read also by Bonaventure de Kung for today starts to actually show itself. Bonaventure in this essay is talking about bodies and movement and dance and performance as expressions and explorations of memory and space and time. He writes... Every movement in space and time, be it a walk, a dance, or otherwise, every gesticulation, every exercise of the muscles and the cells that make up the body is possibly remembered. But every intervention on the body, scarifications, tattoos, scars, injuries, triggers the process of memory. He goes on, I explore the possibility of a corporal literacy, an effort to contextualize the body as a platform, stage, site, and medium of learning, a structure or organ 
that acquires, stores, and disseminates knowledge. This concept implies that the body, in sync with, but also independent of, the brain, has the potential to memorize and pass on slash down acquired knowledge through performativity, the prism of movement, dance, and rhythm. Now, the parallels that I see here between Ansaldúa and Bonaventure's work are nestled in the very discussion of the body as a relational entity. Remember the Spivak quote that I mentioned a few minutes ago. She said, as body, it is a repetition of nature. It is through the significance of my body and others' bodies that cultures become gendered, economical, politic, solved, substantive. Anzaldúa, in her, her writing, extends the conceptualization of the body. In her words, the dance of the waves and the sea, the flow of blood and tree sap, branches and leaves touched by the wind, all of these movements, all of these dances become part of a relational whole. The act of recognizing, I think, here is key. It is a form of conocimiento that allows us to structure ourselves as historical, relational bodies of knowledge. Concurrently to that, figurations allow us to project ourselves from the present towards the future. Starting from our own conocimientos, figurating subjects may actively move and dance and perform towards a vision. And indeed, Bonaventura writes, dances become sites that enliven rituals, spaces of spiritual communication and bonding. The bodies that perform are the tools through or with which the rituals are practiced. The body, in a way, has its own memory. A theater in which we perform over and over. A, a space that has... Wait, uh, let, me, let me see if I can... Um, if I can... Uh, phrase this. So, what I'm thinking right now is the body as memory, right? The body as theater. Um, a theater where we are able to perform over and over that the things that has that have led us to the present moment, the sum total of our actions, feelings, and wounds, and scars, and we do that at the same time while also constructing our futures. Tarotist and social worker Jessica Dore writes, Behavior is the word we use to describe the ways we move and arrange the body, the things we can be seen doing, the space we go and don't go, the ways we act or don't. My body and behavior are constantly giving me cues for things that are otherwise easily forgotten, which is what's happening when you're repeating a traumatic pattern on a loop until you finally remember the first time it happened and can tell the story in its entirety if that's what's needed, or just call it up and move it out. I don't know what keeps us from always seeing behavior in this way, but sometimes I think the body and behavior are the most direct modes of expression there are if we could remember how to listen. Dore, of course, here is focusing on the internal process of getting to know oneself, right? To read oneself and to understand oneself through the body, through movement and through behavior. But this is, of course, not only a process that can occur on the individual level, and indeed, Bonaventure reminds us, and um, this is a quote, through dances like the juba, the chica, or calenda, 
one learns about particular times in history, repressions, racial relations, resistances, resilience, and more. The body of the dancer is the witness. The, wit the witness's narrative, especially when the witness is silent, occurs through performativity. Every performance is to a certain degree a re-experience and re-witnessing rather than just observation. Through dance, the observer becomes witness. The body so is a witness a portal capable of connecting internal and external processes, and that in so doing blurs the boundaries between oneself and the world. What in our identities then results from some kind of inner truth of who we are, and what is a manifestation or a response to our cultures, our geopolitical contexts, our social positions, our families. Here Bonaventura comes in again to point out that in Osho it is said that while the scientist is an, is an observer, the mystic is a witness. The dancer too could be considered a witness in this light their ability to perform the processuality of making histories and offer testimony collapses the separation from inside and outside. He goes on, Art engulfed in sociopolitical reality, histories and knowledges were embodied in dance, as were societal sentiments, traumas, joys and fears. Dance seems to be about connecting with the other, about communion, a group action. Dance reflects sociopolitical realities, current and historical affairs, and needs a community to be lived and experienced. One can find solace in the dance crew, share happiness amongst birds of the same feather. The crew is a place for mentorship, often crucial for community building. This, of course, reminds me of something Butler mentions in their work on gender, the practice of drag. Specifically, I'm thinking about how drag balls have historically been spaces of connection and community building for marginalized groups, and how drag families I guess, a parallel to the dance crew in many ways, open up possibilities of belonging, of mentorship and kinship outside of the heterosexist framework of the nuclear family. And also, of course, joy, the joy of sharing, of finding others with whom we resonate, with whom we joyfully dismantle these structures through bodily onto epistemologies and through practices of corporal literacy, ongoing acts of figuration, visions towards which we move intellectually, emotionally, bodily, and collectively. And here we get to some of the core questions, I think, for today. Reading from Bonaventure again. Political dance, or the construction of dance, as a realm that does not require language, creates a shared embodied space between dancer and spectator, between equality and plurality. The equality of bodies allows them to speak with each other, unmediated by words. The plurality of beings pushes them to express themselves through their bodies. Through these two aspects, dance is inscribed upon the body. And here, here we go to the core. He asks, what is bodily language? Uh, sorry, what is bodily knowledge? How is bodily knowledge acquired? How is bodily, bodily knowledge expressed in dance performances? 
how can the observer of a performance decipher and relate to these bodily knowledges? If rhythm and dance provide the structure for a form of such bodily knowledge, what are the limits? And thinking about this takes me straight back into Ansaldua, who writes that the process of making yourself whole requires all your parts. You can't define yourself by any single genetic or cultural slice. If one aspect is denied or rejected, if you leave some aspect out of the amalgam, la masa, you will not achieve lasting integration. Though integration lasts, of course, only until something new jars you off kilter, which is what she calls the susto. Remember that while Koyal Chauki, in her dismember state, depicted as a disc with topsy-turvy body parts, and body's fragmentation, she also symbolizes reconstruction in a new order. Her round disc, circle, represents the self's striving for wholeness and cohesiveness. The Koyal Chauki process is currently working on each person and her or his culture as both attempt to become more inclusive, more whole. Here to me the link to a corporal literacy becomes clearer. Thinking with the Koyol Chauki, Ansaldua is outlining a rejection of the positivist ontological and epistemological separation of the body into units. Koyol Chauki is depicted as fragmented, right? Her body parts seem to be kind of chaotically pointing towards every direction, as if she suddenly exploded mid-dance. Turning again to the work of Jessica Doré, she writes, We are the wild, and the body, with all its cycles and rhythms and ebbs and flows, and generation and degeneration, is proof. I've heard that learning how to be in the body is one of the best approaches to addressing addictive behaviors. And that's because when we tune in to what truly feels good and that and what doesn't, we are naturally motivated to change rather than feeling like we have to convince ourselves through intellect or knowing that we should. In my experience, this is true. And it's also no wonder at all that we are taught to hate our bodies or that certain body parts or features carry indisputable truths about who we are or who we should be even when those things aren't us at all. The body is a teacher. It holds deep wisdom. It shows us in the most direct possible way what we can control and what we can't that everything is born and also dies, and what goes up must also come down. These words to me resonate so beautifully with Ansaldua's writing and her idea of conocimientos. She writes, to be in conocimiento with another person or group is to share knowledge, pull resources, meet each other, Compare liberation struggles and social movements histories. Share how we confront institutional power and process and heal wounds. In conocimiento, we seek input from communities so as not to fall into elite, collective, isolated cells. Body, movement, dance, corporal literacy, is certainly one way of enacting these conocimientos. But for now, I think we can end here. I am happy that I managed to kind of stay within the 45-minute frame. I've, I hope you've enjoyed this video, and I'm looking forward to hear your thoughts in class. Thank you so much, and see you soon.